Hey everyone, this is David Bombal coming to you from Oxford in the United Kingdom. I'm on a call again with Chuck, who's based in California. And hopefully you're finding these calls really useful. Don't forget to send me messages on Twitter with questions that you have for Chuck. So hey Chuck, how's life in California? Uh, life in California is quite hot today. It's, uh, it's only... Uh... Uh, eight thirty or so here in the morning, but it's supposed to get up to a hundred and thirteen degrees Fahrenheit, which is about forty five degrees in your neck of the woods in Celsius. So it will be a hot one today, very hot. Well, yeah, we we in the middle of a heat wave again, so we'll still. So it's amazing how hot it is. Yeah. <laughs> so Chuck, for, let's forget about the weather. Let's talk about important stuff. So what okay. on earth is NFV? Let's start with that. You bet. So NFE, of course, stands for Network Functions Virtualization. Uh, what it is, uh, is kind of if you parse apart the name, uh, that is kind of what it is. So the general idea is that you have these networking functions uh, that get provided in the data center or in the carrier service provider environment or enterprise or whatever it might be. These uh, network functions can be things like firewalls, uh, load balancers, security, IDS, IPS type stuff. They can be uh, WAN concentrators, a bunch of other carrier type equipment. Um, all of those functions today, or most of those functions today, require cus customers to purchase expensive hardware on which the service is run. And so uh, what that means is that People who have to buy this stuff end up paying a lot of money for it. Uh, you have to have your purchasing department have relationships with all of the different vendors because you're buying all this different hardware. If you want to upgrade things, of course, you need to upgrade your hardware as well as the software. And people were looking at that in this whole software to find whatever revolution and said, wouldn't it be nice if we if this these functions would be executable via software on an industry standard server rather than having to have their specialized hardware. And of course, there's a lot of pushback from the people who create these products because they've spent a lot of money to create really good hardware with special capabilities. So their ASICs and all the other stuff that they build in have a lot of advanced functionality. Uh, the trade-off or the, the counter argument to that, to running it on an industry standard server is that you end up with economies of scale. You're dealing with upgrades at the pace of software rather than hardware. It's much less expensive. If you need more horsepower, you just put more servers on which you run virtual machines, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of the general idea is running network functions that used to run on specialized hardware, running them instead on industry standard servers that you can get from Dell or HP or Cisco or whoever it might be. And so network functions virtualization, the, the virtualization term there is one that often confuses people, confuses me. Uh, it's difficult to know what people are talking about when they talk about virtualization. Yeah. You can talk about uh, virtualization. In this case, it basically means taking something that ran on hardware on a specialized appliance and turning it into a piece of software that you would download and then run on some general purpose uh, computing system like a server. That's one idea of virtualization. We talk about network virtualization in the networking world and quite often what we mean by that is tunneling like VXLAN um, for virtual extensible LAN, uh, NVG or NVGRE network virtualization using GRE. That's another definition of virtualization where you're basically virtualizing the networking capability. And it's easy to get those yeah. confused. Just understand that when people are talking about NFV, what they're really talking about 
is virtualizing those functions. Remember, it's network functions virtualization. So it is what the name implies. It's virtualizing those functions, meaning running them in software. And the place that you run them is on a server somewhere. And a lot of vendors, you know, uh, that provide like your F5s uh, or your checkpoints uh, or your load balancer, uh, firewall, et cetera, vendors, they typically have versions of their product that run on, that are virtualized and can be purchased as software, but that has not been the predominant means of delivery of that functionality up to this point in time. With NFE, uh, you have the promise or the potential for uh, virtualized versions of these things becoming much more prevalent. And you know that you get a lot of other advantages by it being in software. You can deploy that service anywhere that you want geographically. You don't have to package up a box and ship it somewhere. You yeah. can just download the software to whatever branch office or um, uh, other environment that you want, and it's automatically downloaded and up and running in as long as it takes to download and bring up a piece of software. So there's a lot of other advantages too. So you mentioned a lot of things there. So as an analogy, and again, correct me as always if I'm wrong, because it's more than likely going to happen. <laughs> um, in the past, we used to have physical servers. So we had a physical server for email, a physical server for something else like a database and various sort of server functions were dedicated to pieces of hardware. But then through the use of VMware and virtual machines, we virtualized those servers. Is this kind of the same idea, but we're virtualizing firewalls, routers, and other devices? Correct. It's, it's kind of the same idea. Um, <clears throat> so in the past, you would dedicate a physical piece of hardware for running one specific um, type of operation, like an email server, or web server, or whatever. Now you run those on virtual machines. Initially, People were skeptical about the viability of running things in virtual machines. And they said, well, there's too much overhead in having virtual machines. Uh, it's just not a really efficient use of the hardware, et cetera, et cetera. But the advantages uh, so much dwarfed the disadvantages that everybody's doing that in their data centers today. And it's the same idea, you know, to the extent that it takes off uh, this NFE thing, um, I guess we'll figure out if it's going to be a viable alternative or not. I recently went to an open networking summit where they talk about open flow, uh, open daylight, a little bit about NFE, but it's not an NFE conference. But one of the main guys that started the whole NF SDN craze had a session that I attended. His name is Scott Schenker uh, from uh, UC Berkeley. Um, one of the originators of OpenFlow protocol and all this stuff, the Clean Slate program at Stanford and elsewhere. And he had a session that was called Why NFV Has Failed and How We Can Fix It. And sort of springboarding on top of what you said about uh, virtual machines, David, the premise of this session was that we've gone about doing uh, NFE incorrectly. We immediately said, oh, NFE, we need to run our network functions virtually in a virtual machine. And as you and your audience may know, there's currently uh, a fair amount of discussion regarding the best way to do virtualization, whether it is through virtual machines where you have an entire uh, operating system, et cetera, running in a virtualized manager manner, or whether you use containers using technologies such as uh, Docker for your container and Kubernetes for a container orchestrator. Uh, these containers are much more lightweight. They share the operating system, but they have a separate um, container, uh, for lack of a better word, in which your service runs isolated from all the other services. And the premise of this NFV talk to get back to that was that we should not be using virtual machines for our services. Uh, 
and he went so far as to say, nor should we be using uh, the lighter weight containers for our network functions virtualization. He went so far as to suggest that we should just be using applications that run on an operating system. So just like today on your phone or on your computer or whatever, you have multiple applications running. Uh, they were making the claim in this session that these uh, applications being even more lightweight than containers provide all of the segregation that you need between your different functions to run uh, alongside each other. And it simplifies it. We know how to do uh, distributed applications across multiple servers. This is something that, you know, Google and Facebook and Microsoft and everybody are doing every day, every moment of every day. And we have a lot of expertise in doing it. So why don't we do that? So NFV, uh, yeah, I kind of sort of springboarded from what you said, but running in a virtual machine or running in a container, or even as this proposal suggested, running as a separate application. But the main idea is that you turn that hardware appliance into a piece of software and you run it on industry standard servers. That's the general idea of NFV. So Chuck, what's that on your head? What happened to you? Did you get into a fight or what? <laughs> well, I would love to say that, you know, it is the result of what most of my injuries and in bloodletting is a result of, which is either having an accident playing soccer or some other sports uh, or uh, giving blood, <laughs> which sometimes uh, doesn't go exactly the way that you wanted it to. Unfortunately, uh, I'm embarrassed to say that this was actually uh, my house attacked me. So uh, <laughs> you near, my, attacked near you. my bed, um, <laughs> at, at, as my glasses fell off of the nightstand, you know, the thing that sits next to your bed. And I reached down to get them in the morning when it was dark. And unfortunately, we have a very pointy part. Let's see, so how can I make this pointy? A very yep. pointy part of our uh, end table. And my head uh, happened to meet the very sharp corner of my end table. So oh, well. <laughs> yeah, a few choice words later, uh, I got <laughs> a, a, a paper towel and stop the bleeding, but this has been like a week or so. So I look well, pretty tough. It it enhances my manliness, doesn't it? Don't I look way? <laughs> yeah, you should have. You should have just told us you got into a fight or, or something. I should have done that. Yeah, I was protecting a damsel in distress. How's that? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> or you, uh, someone kicked you in the head when you were trying to dive for the soccer ball or something. That that would have been nice. Yes. That would have been better. <laughs> Anyway, let, let's, let, let's get on with the interview, Chuck. Otherwise, people are going to hate us. Okay. So, Chuck, you mentioned a lot of terms there. Do you mind giving us sort of an overview of what is a virtual machine versus what is Docker versus what is Kubernetes? Yeah, sure. So, um, of course, uh, on my laptop or your laptop or desktop or on a server or whatever, uh, it's a generalized piece of hardware on which runs an operating system. And then on that operating system, it is sharing the memory and the disk and the CPU, et cetera, so that your multiple applications can run. That's true on my, on my little phone here. It's true on my laptop or my tablet or whatever. So that's generally yeah. how computers work. The idea of virtual machines actually has been around for a long time. I worked on a product called VM370, which ran on IBM mainframes in the late 1970s. So oh, wow. virtualization has been around for a long time, but it's only in the last decade that it has really uh, become mainstream. And the general idea of a virtual machine is that the software creating the virtual machine environment makes the operating system think that it's running on a separate piece of hardware, but it's really not. So it's making the same calls to get access to memory and the CPU and all the other stuff, but the virtual machine software is intercepting those and it's allowing multiple virtual machines to run on the same physical machine. So in something yeah. like a data center, 
where a server is only utilizing quite often, you know, a fraction of the entire compute power of that system. Uh, this allows you to run multiple virtual machines on a single physical server and thus make way better use of the hardware capabilities that you have. Every one of those virtual machines thinks it's running on its own piece of hardware. It has its own NICs. It has, you know, a certain number of cores in the CPU. It has its own memory, etc. Everything looks to the operating system, the apps running on top of it, like it has its own physical hardware device, but it doesn't. It's just a virtual machine. And you get, you know, really nice, um, efficient use of your compute um, uh, the computing hardware by doing this virtualization. And so that's what a virtual machine is. It's, it is simulating the entire operating system and the applications that run on top of it. Now, a little bit lighter weight thing than that would be a container. And the container uh, technology you've probably heard of most uh, is Docker, there's others out there, and there's other things called containers that get to be confusing. But for our purposes, we're talking about virtual machines, and now a lighter weight version of that is called a container. And the idea of a container uh, is that you have a separate kind of walled domain in which all of your applications can run that's entirely separate from other containers running on the same piece of hardware. And so consequently, what you end up with is you have your own host name, you have your own um, namespace, you have your own NICs, etc. But you are actually sharing the operating system itself with all of the other containers running on that uh, particular system. So as you can imagine, because you're not replicating the operating system every time for every virtual machine, everybody is sharing it, you're using this container technology instead, it's way more lightweight than the virtual machine uh, idea. And so uh, there's a lot of arguments, you know, uh, basically back and forth about VMs are better, no, containers are better, no, this is better, et cetera, et cetera. So that fight is still going on. Um, you know, we're still in the evolutionary process going from physical machines to virtual machines. So this is kind of early to go already from virtual machines to containers. But, you know, people are still making that uh, evolutionary progression from physical to virtual to considering containers. So there's still dust that needs to settle in that whole environment and that argument. So that's kind of what the those two different things are virtual machines versus containers. Now people have heard of Kubernetes. Kubernetes is an orchestrator or like a management and control piece of software whose goal it is, is to manage a number of these containers. And so uh, Kubernetes happens to be one implementation that was originally created by Google. It has since been open sourced and it's probably uh, the most popular one in use today, especially by people who favor open source software. Uh, Docker has their own version of an orchestrator for Docker. It's called Docker Swarm uh, that competes with Kubernetes. Kubernetes will uh, has defined interfaces so that it can use multiple um, containers down below it, but the one that you'll see kind of most often would be Docker. So you have Kubernetes uh, over the top orchestrating all of these Docker containers that are running either on one system or on multiple systems. And that's kind of the general idea is that something like Kubernetes has knowledge of what uh, instances need to be spun up, where they need to be spun up, when they are no longer necessary, etc. That's the general, you know, high level abstract view of what Kubernetes is and what Docker's containers are and what virtual machines are. There are virtual machine orchestrators as well. Of course, VMware uh, not only has virtual machine technology, but it has, uh, you know, the whole VMware service that they provide that helps you to manage 
virtual machines in your network. Of course, they orchestrate virtual networks as well. They create a version of SDN called overlay-based SDN uh, with their um, uh, VMware uh, products that will work either with, um, you know, either with their own virtual machines or with other vendors' virtual machines. So there's there's orchestration for all of these things, but Kubernetes is the orchestrator that's probably most popular for containers in a virtualized environment. So Kubernetes is kind of, as an analogy, similar to vSphere or whatever management product you're using from VMware or others to manage virtual machines, Kubernetes is used to manage uh, containers. That is, is, is that correct, right? yep, yep. Okay, and um, just to make sure I understand this and for everyone's benefit, if I had 10 virtual machines running on a host operating system, that host operating system could be Windows or could be ESXi, could be something, I end up having 11 operating systems, don't I? So I've got the host plus the 10 virtual machines. But with That's correct. The virtual machines are referred to as guests and the yep. the main one on which everything else is running is a host. So a lot of my job involves uh, spinning up Linux virtual machines to build my software and I run other virtual machines to simulate uh, hardware devices, etc. So I have as my um, host operating system is Windows 10 and I'm running VirtualBox, uh, which is free. And on VirtualBox, uh, I have multiple virtual machines. I'm, you know, I, I teach classes for other uh, vendors for SDN. And I just before we started recording this, I had three virtual machines up and running. One was the SDN controller. One was the Mininet uh, network, and one was the kind of the user interf interface app server, all running on top of my Windows virtual machine. So I have, like you say, I have four um, operating systems running. One is the host, and then on top of that host that's running the virtualization software, VirtualBox in my case, I have the three guest operating systems. But if you were using Docker containers or some kind of container technology, you would only have one operating system. Is that right? That is a true statement. And I would be running multiple containers that would have instances, say, of my application. A lot of times the containers are used not to run a bunch of multiple applications, but to have a single purpose. So like an instance of an email server or a web server or an SD-WAN uh, controller or something like that. And that's why containers are so lightweight because they don't run redundant operating systems. You just get the application that you want rather than having to install a whole app, a whole operating system with a bunch of stuff that you don't need. Is that right? That is true. So, uh, but I will tell you, virtualization has its advantages. You know, running virtual machines has its advantages. I can run different operating systems. So on my host, I could be running a Mac OS as well as Linux, as yeah. well as Windows, if I needed to do that. And in fact, in the situation I described, on one of my virtual machines, I'm running the Ubuntu version of Linux. On another one, I'm re running a Cent OS version of Linux. And on a third one, I'm running a different distribution of Linux. So I'm running three different Linux type of operating systems in VirtualBox. So it, it does depend on what your needs are. If you are, yeah. everything's running on the same operating system, then maybe it makes sense to do containers. If you have a need to run different OSs, like your, you know, I have no idea what it is, your web service is on Linux, but your um, shared folders is running on Windows and you need to yeah. be able to swap them around, then probably a, a virtual machine type environment may be better for you. And hence you saying that, you know, there's still the dust still needs to settle because some people will say there's advantages to the one over the other. Yes, and they hold uh, their own opinions fiercely and believe <laughs> that course. you should agree with them. So not unlike politics in the United States. So uh, <laughs> let's, let's not get into that. <laughs> yes, so, a, lot of, now, a lot of this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned this is 
twice now, I think. Um, so just to clear it up for everyone, you mentioned the difference briefly between NFV versus virtual networks. And I'm assuming when you talk about virtual networks, you're talking about overlay SDN networks. Is that right? Uh, yep, that's correct. So what, what, what's it, can you briefly explain what a virtual network is versus, I mean, NFV you've said is like virtualizing a function, which could be virtualizing a firewall. But what is a virtual network? Because that term goes around as well. That's a great question. But let me start by answering a question you didn't ask, but maybe on people's minds, because I hear, yeah, uh, you know, some of the folks that uh, are your people, David, have written to me and said, hey, I don't really understand this business about this and that. And the this and that that they talk about are NFV and uh, SDN. So hopefully, yeah, um, you know, you know a little bit about NFV if you've listened to what I was talking about and didn't fall asleep a little bit earlier. Um, <laughs> you know what that is about. So how do the two work together? It's really fairly straightforward. The idea of NFV is that I can spin up and run a virtual networking function anywhere that I want on uh, an industry standard server. The question is, now that it's been virtualized and is running on an industry standard server, how do I pump uh, my networking packets and traffic through that service? And that's where SDN comes in. So you use software defined networking to route traffic through your firewall, through your load balancer, through your IDS, IPS, through your WAN concentrator, whatever it might be, you need to dynamically be able to change the way that packets are routed through the network. And in order to do that, no matter what version of SDN you're using to accomplish it, you need to use software defined networking. And so uh, SDN routes the traffic into these now virtualized or software based services running on servers in the network. So that's kind of the general idea of software defined network and NFV and how they work together. Now you specifically asked about Be before we go into overlays, I'm glad you brought that up. So be sure. sorry to interrupt Chuck, because no I think it's it's really important that you that you mention this. Is this also to do with a service chaining idea that you often hear people talk about? Yeah, so service chaining, uh, if you have to do it manually, then you need to you know, daisy chain wires through your network and put in the big machine, the big appliance one after the other and have your service, have your traffic routed through your services that way. With the advent of virtualized services running on servers somewhere in the network and routing, which is dynamic now via SDN, you can now chain these things together. So first, when a packet comes in, you know, it goes through your evolved packet core, it goes through your firewall, it goes through a load balancer, you know, whatever it is in terms of services, you can line those up and route traffic through them appropriately. Now, uh, it's way easier to plug in wires and have everything be statically configured yeah. and not have to worry about stuff. And that is, nobody's going to dispute that that's way easier. The situation that we face these days, though, is we live in a world of dynamic uh, services in terms of servers and compute and storage. And we live in a world where we want to be able to dynamically change how uh, the networks behave. And in that world, we're going to have services or network functions that move around, and we're going to have um, services that move around and therefore we're going to need to have traffic that gets routed appropriate to where the service is. And that's why we need to get to this automated, more automated, more dynamic, um, more software driven way of doing networking. Because the problem is if you vMotion a server, a virtual machine from one physical server to another, your service chaining or your whole stuff that routes the traffic to that server needs to be adjusted now. Is, is that kind of what, you, what you're what saying as well? Yeah, that's correct. In fact, that's kind of one of the arguments that's driven this whole um, <clears throat> technological trajectory that we're on with respect to making things software uh, driven or software defined is, you know, in the data center, you can do a v motion, 
that moves the service from one spot to another. You can do that with the push of one button and depending on the size of the VM, it takes 30 seconds to a couple of minutes. However, getting the networking to follow that so yeah. that you can now use it today takes a week or a month because you have to have a trouble ticket that people who have to do things uh, in terms of configuration have to figure out how to modify the configuration. They have to deploy the configuration. They have to fix it because they probably did it wrong. You know, all of that stuff um, yeah. <coughs> takes way manual. too long. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So does that lead us into the virtual networks discussion? Because the next question is, okay, so how do you do this then? How, how are people implementing this idea that you move the VM and things follow along in the network sphere? Yeah, so kind of the backstory to software-defined networking is the, this whole idea of virtualization in the data center primarily was taking hold and people who had data center stuff, and let's face it, everything's in the cloud these days, um, yep. So everything is data center based or just about everything. Um, <clears throat> networking had to follow. So all of the folks who had been giving us, you know, all the really cool protocols and the really cool advancements to uh, BGP and to OSPF and ISIS and to Spanning Tree and to Trill um, and to Shortest Path Bridging and all of this other stuff, they said, oh, we need to figure out a way to have networking keep pace with this. And so they came up with this idea of network virtualization. And that's the term that was used for protocols, which as I mentioned, are mainly tunneling protocols of the nature of VXLAN, NVGRE, stateless transport tunneling. Those type of protocols were invented um, for a number of reasons, but primarily they've been applied in the data center. Yeah. And as you probably know, the general idea of the protocols is that you take the original packet, uh, which you would normally just ship off to a physical device uh, from the server. Since you're using virtualization, you take the original packet and before you even leave the server, when you are still running in that virtual switch or virtual router in uh, on the server in the virtualization software in the hypervisor what it's going to do is it's going to encapsulate that original packet with another packet and so that other packet then gets sent out into the network that means that this other packet has its own mac uh source and destination ip source and destination and the original packet is hidden inside it, it's encapsulated. That's the whole idea of tunneling. And so you create these things that we call tunnels between virtual switches on ends of the network, and then you pass packets that are encapsulated from one end to the other. And that's the idea of virtualization. I mentioned VXLAN, which is the predominant one from Cisco and VMware back when they were uh, BFFs. I was telling a class uh, <laughs> that stands for best friends forever. Uh, I was telling a class of Fujitsu people, I think in Texas, and they said, oh, so they were BFFFN. And I thought I was, you know, hip to the language and understood what that was, but BFFFN, I didn't know what that is. Uh, and, he, and he said, his teenager told him BFFFN stands for best friends forever for now. <laughs> and I think that's kind of what happened to Cisco and VMware, as you're probably aware, they're no longer best friends, you know. Yeah. Cisco thinks VMware is um, in, infringing, I'm not sure if that's the right word, but they're sort of creeping in to the networking world with their virtual switches and virtual routers running in the hypervisor of their software. Um, you know, Cisco has its own uh, virtualization stuff. So the two are no longer best friends. But uh, yeah, VXLAN, yep. still the most predominant one. NVGRE used to be Microsoft's baby, and they used to be doing things um, uh, in their um, Azure data centers using NVGRE. Um, I've, I heard from somebody actually in Australia who said that, you know, Microsoft recently announced that they weren't uh, 
using uh, NVGRE anymore. This is as of a couple of months ago. They're using VXLAN. I looked up, I found one article that mentioned that, but it I wasn't sure if it was definitive or not. I'll let you know the folks listening can investigate and figure out what's what in that regard. But yeah, they do basically the same thing, Mac in IP encapsulation and just to round off the discussion of network virtualization stateless transport tunneling was developed by Nasira, who is one of the first SDN companies for the data center that did this overlay technology. And their claim about stateless transport tunneling is that they take better advantage of certain capabilities in server NICs that would be um, large segment uh, offload, which allows you to pass, uh, it allows the system to very efficiently handle large amounts of data. Um, anyway, that's probably giving you more information than you that's need, great. but that's the idea of network virtualization and you know what it kind of is in the networking realm these days. More detail is always better, Chuck. Good. Technical calls like this is always <laughs> nice to get into the nitty gritty. 